them specifically as well. So the whole premise of these dumb systems is the chip that you've got implanted is unique. Absolutely cannot be cloned, guaranteed. Um, as we all know, there have been several talks where people have produced cloning devices. So um, that's you know, just simply not true. You can clone a tag. Uh, the, that isn't chopped off. That is the full URL there. .pl, I believe, is the, the end of the URL. But this is Jonathan Westhus's um, device, which he demonstrated last year at DEF CON. That will clone uh, a Verichip, I believe. It was Verichip standard. The circuit diagram, all the software, all the component parts are on his website, and it will cost you a grand total of about 20 bucks to build that thing. Um, bit of work. It's a double-sided circuit board, um, and you'll have to burn that yourself. So uh, it's a bit fiddly, but nothing you can't do uh, over a weekend. So when someone comes up with one of these things, there's always a, an industry response and a defense. So I, you know, I like to imagine after last year's talk at DEF CON, some techie who was there, some poor little geeky kid in the company, comes back to the company and says, oh my god, it's game over, they're cloning our tags. And the executives are like, oh, no, no, don't worry, don't worry, we'll come up with a solution. So this is what they came up with. <laughs> that doesn't look like a tag. We're fine. Don't worry about it. Nothing to see here. Second line of defense. If you have patent attorneys, you could always talk to them. Um, HID versus IO Active. I'm not going to say anything too specific about this um, in case there's anyone from HID or practicing patent attorneys or any other kind of attorney in the room. Um, but basically, IO Active were going to give a talk about HIDs, and then they didn't. And there was some discussion between the two companies, which has been published. Um, so if you're interested in reading that, I believe they've now kissed and made up and uh, IOActive are talking here or have already talked. I'm, I'm over at DEF CON, so I'm not kind of keeping up with what's going on. But that should be a very interesting talk if it hasn't happened yet. Do you know if it's happened yet? Um, have a look in your program. IOActive, uh, Chris Padgett, I think, is going to give the talk. So anyway, bottom line is the actual reader... Um, can't see the tag. So what it physically looks like is utterly irrelevant. So if you do a bit of research, you'll find that um, Jonathan Westhus's device and Chris Paget's alleged device, which may or may not exist, I cannot confirm or deny, um, isn't unique. I mean, there's loads of them. You go out there, there's a bunch of these things. Um, and this last one, on the bottom right-hand corner is a, a project on Circuit Seller over the weekend, do your own RFID system. But that's okay, because none of them look like tags. So nothing to worry about. You're all safe. So I took that as a challenge, because I like a challenge. So my challenge was, can I produce, can I bypass this whole argument and produce a true clone? one that has the same ID and actually looks like the original. Exact same form factor. So in order to do that, I first have to understand how do I, you know, what, what does the ID consist of? The thing with these circuits that are, are playing them back, they don't have to understand that. You can just record the signal and play it back and you really don't need to know how to construct it. Um, but I wanted to understand exactly what the, the underlying um, signal was. Or the, the data. So luckily they use industry standards, so I can just take an industry standard example and have a look at how it's constructed. So I looked at animal tagging. They use, in the UK and most of Europe and I think parts of the US, they use ISO 11784 and 5, um, otherwise known as FDX um, A or B. I'm going to look at FDX B. That gives you um, three fields. An application flag which says it's an animal um, product or not, three-digit manufacturer or country code, and then the national ID. And the national ID is issued by the country or the manufacturer. So the tag and the reader will successfully communicate 
the reader will be able to read, read the tag if a tag comes up and, and follows the right parameters. And those parameters are it's going to talk on a particular frequency, so the dumb tags tend to be 125, 134. Smart tags are, are these days mostly in the 1356 range. They'll talk at a specific bit rate, which is the um, frequency divided by some factor of two. Um, and then it will modulate the signal according to a specific standard, like FSK or Manchester biphase, whatever. And then, of course, you have the actual data pattern. So if we look at the raw data that I get out of a, a dumb reader that's not trying to interpret it, I'll get eight bytes, and that's divided up into a national ID, country, and application code. Very simple, just take this chunk of the bits, this chunk, this chunk. You then have to tweak them slightly, reverse them, reverse the nibbles, and so on. So I put into the slides, um, for anyone who's that interested, they can follow this, um, exactly what's happening to a particular ID. So we take that top line, that's the ID I get, turn it back to front, reverse each nibble. And there I have my application ID, which says at 8,000, I'm an animal. Um, country F65, left shift that, no, sorry, right shift that turn it into decimal. You can then look that up in a database. So it's either the ISO standard country code or if it's above 900, it'll be the icar.org um, name. And in this case, the example I looked at uh, is Digital Angel, who now are known as Verichip. And then you've got the national ID that they issued. So obviously, if I can decode a signal, I can encode a signal. I just reverse the decoding process, um, add the headers, add the checksums, and so on. What they do here as well is um, this header is, is all zeros. So in order to make sure you don't accidentally get a header repeating in the bit stream, you chop it up into four-bit chunks. Um, so this header is, I think, nine bits long. You chop it up into four-bit chunks and put a one every, in between every four bits. So you can't possibly have nine zeros in a row. And that's just to stop it. That's just so it knows where in the bitstream it is. Because all that happens, you stick the, the tag in the reader, the reader wakes it up, and the tag will just start barfing out its number, and it will just keep doing it. As long as it's energized, it will just go blip, 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 blip. So it, it looks for the header to find where the beginning of the stream is. OK, so now, after we've done all that, we end up with 128 bits of data. But how do I deliver that? Remember, I'm trying to do it in the same form factor. I don't want to be building any circuitry, trying to make my own little plastic cases and stuff. So I want to use the technology against itself. So I thought about the industry, and I thought about the manufacturers. If I was a manufacturer, and I'm working in this industry that's exploding, you know, there's a plethora of new standards coming out, what would I do? I would build some kind of super tag that I could just program to be the standard that I want to be. So, you know, the frequency is the same. You've got a few different parameters that I need to set. It's going to be much easier if I have a device that's capable of doing all those different parameters, right? So if I can think of that, um, someone in the industry can too. And sure enough, I looked around. And there's a couple of devices that match that. There's a thing called the Q5. The Q5, you can program each of the individual parameters. So you can set what bit rate to use, what modulation it's going to use. It's got 224 bits of user programmable memory, so that's plenty of room to put my 128-bit data. And I can tell it how many blocks to, to spit out when it wakes up. The other approach is you um, have categories of um, parameters sort of stuck together. And the, the Philips high tag follows that standard. So they have three different formats of tag, or, or of um, behavior. And they call them public modes. So A, B, and C. And I believe A is animal standard, B is door entry systems, and C is car immobilizers. Typical, typical use for that particular family of tags. And again, I can program some data and tell it how much of that to spit out when it wakes up. So as far as sending the ID goes, um, I had a bit of luck. I was working in a shared office building, and I had a, a tag. And when I started playing with this stuff, it turned out my reader was telling me this was a Q5 tag. So in theory, I can reprogram it. 
So as long as I can figure out the bit rate, the modulation, whether I need to invert the data and so on, I should be able to reprogram this tag to behave the way I want to behave. So that's what I did. So I'll give you a quick demonstration of uh, cloning a tag called a, a Trovan Unique. Um, this is a brand that's very commonly used in access control systems, um, human implants, so, well, animal implants. Uh, some people are implanting them in themselves. Um, and as I said, if you're interested, I've got the bits here. Uh, you might not want one of those stuck in you, but if you do, come and see me afterwards. I've got some tags as well. Um, but anyway, I'm going to show you uh, reprogramming a tag to be a, a Troban tag. So I have here a door entry system, which looks like that. And actually, this is interesting in itself. Uh, how many of you flew here? Raise hands, most of you. Going through security these days is quite fun, right? Um, when you have something like this in your hand. <laughs> so um, I tend to carry that in my hand luggage because I suspect if they, if they scan my normal luggage and see that, you know, it's got a little battery, it's got a controller, it's got some wires and things, um, I might be hearing a sort of muffled crump around the back of the airport and that's my luggage blown into a million pieces. Um, so I carry it with me so I can explain what the hell it's for, and I can demonstrate it. And uh, on one trip coming through security, uh, I was directly behind a, a couple who had a newborn baby. And they had a whole load of luggage, and they had the pram, and they had all, you know, everything with them, the kitchen sink. So the lady goes through, she takes the baby through, and the pram goes through, and all their, their luggage and their crap goes through. And the last thing that's left behind was a, a box with six bottles of milk in it. And um, the, the guy screening the baggage says, well, you can't take fluids on board. So the, the father's like, well, I have to. You know, we're going on a 12-hour flight. We've got a newborn baby. I've got to take the milk on board. So he calls his supervisor over. And the supervisor says, um, no, that's okay. We can make an exception for the milk. But you have to prove that it's drinkable milk. Six bottles of baby milk. The father's like, okay, uh, so he's got to taste each one. And I'm thinking, what kind of milk is that exactly? <laughs> but he obviously loves his wife, and he tastes the milk, and it all goes through, okay. Um, what they get up to on their own time is you know, nothing to do with us. Who are we to judge? Um, anyway, the milk goes through. By this time, there's quite a big crowd has built up behind, and everyone's getting impatient, and I'm standing there. And we've now got three people behind the desk. So we got the original guy who was doing the stuff, we got the guy who, who looks at the screen, and we got the supervisor. And they're all standing there, and they look, you know, they, this is all gone, and they look up, and there's the picture of my bag. <laughs> and it's got wires, and it's got batteries, and it's got all sorts of crap. I mean, this is nothing what I've got on the desk here compared to what I've got down there. And so I'm thinking, OK, floor, swallow me now. It's going to be trouble. Um, big crowd of people behind, wondering what's going to happen, and they're all looking at it, and they're looking really intensely at the screen. And then one of them goes to me, there's no fluids in there, are there? <laughs> so that's okay. You can bring your bomb-looking thing on board, but <laughs> as long as it's not liquid. No, okay, fine. On you go. Run along. So, crazy times we live in. So anyway, my bot, my... Um